good uh, morning, uh, good uh, day, uh, good evening uh, to all uh, all our uh, participants in this uh, project Jacobson lecture. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, lecture, the 2020 lecture, which as you know, is sponsored by the foundation uh, of the same name. Uh, as you may know, uh, Per Jacobson was the VIS economic advisor from September 1931 until October 1956 and then became the managing director of the IMF until he passed away while in office in 1963. The foundation was established that year and has been closely associated with the VIS over the years. The foundation goals are to improve international cooperation in the monetary and economic fields, goals that are very closely aligned with the ones of the VIS. So this year, year speaker uh, is a, a tremendously a, a brilliant a economist, a Professor Catherine Sheng. Uh, who is a professor of economic and so social history of the University uh, uh, of Oxford. Uh, she's a towering figure in the history of the global financial system. Uh, Catherine has extensively studied the history of international cooperation and coordination, including the role of the VIS uh, in its evolution. We were honored to host her as the Alexander Lanfalusi Senior Research Fellow at the VIS from 2018 to last summer. Professor Schenk will deliver a very timely lecture on central bank cooperation and US dollar liquidity. What can we learn from the past? I'm especially pleased uh, that uh, she kindly agreed to share her insights on the topic of central bank cooperation this year as the VIS celebrates its, its 90th anniversary. And of course, I mean, it, this is like a little bit like a wedding through Zoom. Uh, I mean, it's a very bad uh, substitute. <laughs> uh, we, we would all have uh, preferred to have uh, this uh, <coughs> lecture uh, in, in real life uh, at the time of our annual meetings where we certainly were where, I mean, we basically prepared a big uh, party with many, many events, and one of the key events, needless to say, was this. Uh, and, and that's why we engaged with Catherine uh, with some advance, knowing that uh, she would produce something very interesting and uh, that uh, she was the perfect person uh, for this anniversary. So in any case, I hope you to invite you to the party next June in the annual meetings of the VIS. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, COVID-19 will, will allow it. Uh, now going a little bit to the topic of today's uh, lecture, Dolling, dollar funding liquidity has been topical lately, but it turns out that a, a, a historical perspective sheds much light on the issue. The COVID-19 crisis and the financial market stresses that uh, it has brought on, have shown how important dollar liquidity is for the global economy. It turns out that dollar liquidity was also very important in the early history of the offshore dollar market in the 60s and 70s, and we see many of the echoes of the current global financial system even then. Her work also underlines the pivotal, pivotal role of central banks as central banks responded with swap lines and dollar funding facilities, they stabilized the global monetary and financial system. Once again, they have provided the global public good. We can learn from the, this recent event and the further past on how best to assure that central bank coordination remains <coughs> up to the future challenges. Immediately after Catherine's lecture, our high-level lineup of panelists, Adam Tuz, Brad Setzer, Linda Goldberg, Ricardo Rice, and Harold James, will give their remarks on the lecture. Then there will be a Q&A session 
where some of you are invited <coughs> to put your questions and comments to Catherine and the panel. <coughs> uh, you will note we are live streaming the whole event on the VIS public website and also recording it for view viewing later. Let me now give uh, the floor to Guillermo Ortiz, who is here in his capacity as chairman of the Per Jacobson uh, uh, Foundation, and he will be chairing the event. So, Guillermo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Agustin, and um, thank you for inviting us to the party next year. Uh, we, we all hope to, uh, to join you there, by all means. <clears throat> thank you for the introduction. As you mentioned, the issue of dollar liquidity of the global economy for decades. Uh, it has become obviously more important as the dollar has gained uh, the stature as a reserve currency and also as a world currency in which um, most of the uh, transactions both in the financial markets and in trade uh, are denominated. And it uh, comes to the uh, forefront uh, in the uh, framework of central bank cooperation in times of crisis, um, <clears throat> more notably uh, during the uh, great financial crisis of 2008-2009, and now, as you mentioned, Agustin, uh, with the um, <clears throat> coronavirus-induced uh, crisis. So it's very timely <clears throat> for this occasion of the 19th anniversary of the BIS, that Catherine Schenk uh, will provide us with a historical uh, account and perspective with her lecture, Central Bank Cooperation and U.S. Dollar Liquidity. What can we learn from the past? Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, Catherine has had a, a very long and outstanding career in academia. She's professor of economic and social history at Oxford University. She has held academic positions at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, Royal Holloway, University of London, and University of Glasgow. She has been also a visiting professor at other uh, institutions. Um, <clears throat> she's been uh, visiting researchers at the International Monetary Fund and the Hong Kong Institute of Monetary Research. She's a, an associate fellow in international economics uh, at Chatham House in London, and she's on the Academic Council of the European Association of Banking and Financial History. She has been a prolific writer. She's wrote, written uh, several books and, and articles, and also she holds an MBA, a BA and MA degree in economics, international relations and Chinese studies from Toronto University, and a PhD in economic history from the London School of Economics. Now, without further ado, let me invite uh, Catherine to take the floor, please. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, this, the year of the Bank of International Settlements 90th anniversary, was originally meant to provide an opportunity for celebration of the survival and adaptation of this unique institution through the gyrations of decades of profound change in the global monetary and financial system. It was also an opportunity to reflect critically on some of the more controversial areas of the bank's history. For example, my contribution to the anniversary book described the tortuous progress towards expanding the membership and governance of the BIS to better match the global system and the entrenched resistance to that process amongst past governors. Instead, the 90th anniversary has fallen in what is arguably the world's greatest human challenge in 70 years a catastrophic year that has challenged the precepts of international cooperation that lie at the heart of the BIS's mission, while at the same time confirming the importance of international coordination in the face of a simultaneous global shock. Last year, three months before the pandemic struck, Sir Mervyn King finished his Perry Atkinson lecture, which came this morning that the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. Rather than escape from old ideas, my lecture this year seeks inspiration from them. There's an old adage that if you want to enjoy eating your sausages, you should never visit a sausage factory. Seeing how they are made exposes the mess and waste that is even cased in the final product. So it is with history. 
My work delves into the secret internal correspondence, the abandoned plans, the compromises and manipulation of data that goes into economic policy making. Now, the governors and their staff present today are well acquainted with the sausage factory of central bank cooperation. So I hope they don't lose their appetite for it by hearing from some of the hidden records of the predecessors. The BIS was founded in the crucible of the post-World War I reshaping of the European political and economic landscape in the midst of what turned out to be a 30 years war, but it quickly grew out of the constraints of its original purpose of governing reparations. The first BIS AGM took place in May 1931, just after the start of the Credit Anstalt bank crisis in Austria, threatened European and therefore global financial stability, and tested the new institution's ability to foster a central bank. At the height of the crisis in September 1931, Herr Jakobsen made his transition from the League of Nations to become the economic advisor for the BIS, a post he held for the formative first 25 years of the bank's existence. In the end, of course, central bank cooperation was unable to stop the European financial crisis that toppled the international economy. After the Second World War, there was considerable hostility, not least from John Maynard Keynes, to the persistence of this central bankers club, particularly as arrival to the new International Monetary Fund. But the BIS successfully reinvented itself several times over in the decades that followed, hosting European monetary cooperation, taking charge of data collection and dissemination, managing global liquidity, as we shall see, in the 1960s and 1970s, and drawing up banking standards from 1970s and 1980s. But it retained its essential features as a bank for central banks and as a forum for discrete exchanges of view and development of personal relationships among central bankers to promote cooperation. To mark the BIS's 75th anniversary in 2005, the bank commissioned a group of essays specifically on the history of central bank cooperation, which was published in 2008, just as that time when the global financial crisis struck. As Pete Cunard pointed out then, central bank cooperation stems from the origins of modern central banking in the 19th century, particularly in the management of the classic gold standard. In the 1920s, Montague Norman and Benjamin Strong envisaged a network of cooperating central banks around the world and set about establishing them in the emerging markets of their day in Latin America and Australasia. It's not my intention to rehearse the well-established trend of waxing and waning cooperation detailed in that volume and by so many others. Rather, I hope to highlight some less well-recognized episodes and reflect on how the past has been used in policymaking. First, I'd like to make a distinction that many make between cooperation and coordination. Cooperation, as it sounds, is operational, particularly the gathering dissemination of information, sharing best practice, research, and data, creating operational structures to enhance the functioning of markets. This is the very bread and butter of the BIS. Coordination goes deeper to require the common application of rules, such as foreign exchange intervention or setting applying and applying common codes and standards, such as the Basel Accords from the late 1980s onward. In both cases, there needs to be a common interest, but the relative costs and benefits can be lower with cooperation than with coordination, which can require some loss or sharing of control or sovereignty. To make this distinction clear, we can consider the Basel Committee itself. It was founded after a shudder in the newly internationalized banking system in the summer of 1974, revealed how the prudential supervision model based on national central banks no longer matched the structure of international banking. The G10 governor's original mandate for the committee was to establish an early warning system for cross-border banking crisis. But this level of coordination was rejected by the committee at its first meeting by the chair, George Blunden from the Bank of England. In the end, the committee could not produce an agreed response to the governor's call for an early warning system, and Blunden submitted his own response, which focused on sharing best practice and confidential knowledge, what they called to each other in gossip, rather than creating an early warning system for cross-border banking crises. The committee then spent months trying to set out jurisdictional responsibilities for foreign branches and subsidiaries, but progress was limited, and it was accepted that cooperation would continue to rely on confidentially sharing information between central banks rather than new initiatives. The first years of the Basel Committee, therefore, enhanced cooperation, but demonstrated resistance to coordination. From its start, the main obstacle was an inability to resolve where responsibility lay for lender of last resort in a globalizing banking and financial system where the currency of international finance was the dollar. This remains an important open question, 
answered in part by central bank swaps, to which I will return. Now, there's a huge literature on international economic and monetary cooperation, much of the best written by members of the panel here today. That's not the kind of coordination that I'm going to stress today. Instead, I'm going to focus more on the antecedents to the coordination that central banks pursued in the late 2000s. But first, a reflection on how history, or the past, has been used during the last decade or so. At times of crisis, or when change is on the horizon, policymakers and the public often invoke past episodes and experiences to explain their responses. This year, for central bankers facing the urgency of the pandemic's impact on the international financial system, the experience of 2007-2008 was particularly close to hand. The innovations and structures deployed in that crisis, for example, the central bank liquidity swaps, were quickly reactivated and extended. It seems that central bankers have already learned from history about the importance of coordination to ensure adequate dollar liquidity around the world. This was a lesson drawn most directly from the 1930s and reflects the prominent role of economic historians in framing our understanding of how to respond to financial crisis. For example, Christina Romer, as head of Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, and Ben Bernanke, chair of the Federal Reserve in 2008. The memoirs of many of the key actors make explicit how they were influenced by histories of the Great Depression. When the global financial crisis struck, the 1930s became the benchmark against which the intensity of the economic crisis was measured. And the solution in the U.S. was linked directly to Friedman and Schwartz's seminal monetary history of the United States from 1963, which blamed the U.S. depression on the failure of the Federal Reserve to pursue an expansionary monetary policy. From 2008, central banks embarked on dramatic monetary expansion led by the U.S. Federal Reserve. But this was not a cooperative or a coordinated initiative on an international basis and was blamed subsequently for disruptions, particularly in emerging markets. Thinking back to the lessons of the past, many of the efforts at international coordination in the 1930s were less successful than the 2000s. In 1931, the BIS arranged a network of central bank credits to the Austrian-Hungarian central banks to try to forestall the collapse of the Kreditanstalt and the Austrian currency. But this ambitious initiative eventually failed. Notably, the Fed was a major contributor despite the isolationist stance of their government. Unlike the G20 summit in 2008, the World Economic Conference of 1933 failed to deliver anything meaningful. Three weeks into the 12-week schedule, President Roosevelt suddenly announced that the talks were too biased toward exchange rate policy and not enough toward promoting recovery. With the Americans unwilling to participate, the meeting ended early. Forty years later, in 1973, just as the Bretton Woods system collapsed and the dollar floated, Charles Kindleberger published his classic World in Depression, 1929 to 1939. He argued that when the American government turned away from international cooperation after 1919 and did not sustain open markets and countercyclical international lending, this worsened the global depression. Back then, the Americans learned this lesson relatively quickly and took a very different role in the reconstruction of the international economy after 1945, building their vision of post-war trade and payments into their negotiations with the UK over wartime support for the Allied cause. From the Atlantic Charter signed dramatically by Churchill and Roosevelt in North Atlantic off Newfoundland in 1941, through to Lend-Lease and in the White Plan for the International Monetary Fund, the wartime American administration was committed to freer trade and payments and formal institutions for coordination. They found general agreement from the UK and other European states on the principle, if not the detail. In sum, a lesson from history is the persistent importance of American leadership. This isn't just because of the size of its economy and geopolitical power, but also because of the importance of dollar liquidity in global markets. While the 1930s interwar depression remains a touchstone for central bankers looking for lessons, they should also look beyond this episode, and an obvious place to start is the Bretton Woods era when peg exchange rates highlighted the interdependence of policymaking. During the 1960s, central banks began to knit together an international financial safety net once it was clear that the IMF's limited resources, slow procedures, and conditionality were no match for rising capital flows. This was an era of global imbalances blamed on inflation and low savings on the American side and on German balance of payment surpluses on the other. It was an era when the mechanics of monetary policy were not always well understood well before the generalized shift to central bank independence in the 1980s and 1990s. Moreover, it was a period of paid exchange rates rather than a floating dollar. In this case, the past really is a foreign country. 
But dollar liquidity was under intense discussion during the 1960s. On the one hand, there was, was there too much liquidity generating global inflation? Or was there too little liquidity? So the system needed another international money. The 1960s was the decade of the retreat of sterling as a source of global liquidity. Uh, the share of sterling in global foreign exchange reserves, for example, was overtaken by the dollar in 1955. I argue that this process happened as smoothly as it did because of multilateral central bank cooperation. But these were mainly arguments about reserves liquidity, not global financial liquidity. Exchange controls inhibited capital flows, but there was nevertheless an era of surging offshore dollar liquidity through the euro dollar market. Here you can see just the growth of the euro dollar market in its early years and a share of uh, US GDP. This novel market prompted multiple innovations in international central bank cooperation. Among the many plumbing patches to shore up the international monetary system, the G10 central bankers made a pact in 1961 to support the dollar market price of gold at the official Bretton Woods Hall. These operations brought foreign exchange managers together regularly in Basel to discuss global liquidity and exchange markets. Their frank and private discussions in what became the Golden Foreign Exchange Committee, now the Markets Committee, eventually inspired the Euro Currency uh, Standing Committee, specifically to monitor and discuss the burgeoning Euro dollar market. There was another outcome of the Golden Foreign Exchange Committee meetings that has not been as well understood, and that is the reporting of the Fed central bank swaps and the multilateral, multilateral system of central bank credits. I'd like to spend some time discussing the origins of the Federal Reserve bilateral currency swaps which became such an important part of central bank coordination in 2008 and again in 2020. There are three key points I want to make. First, that this system was pushed on a reluctant group of European central bankers by the Federal Reserve. Secondly, that the idea rose and developed in the context of an emerging system of European multilateral central bank support and other US bilateral credits. So the swap should not be viewed in isolation. Finally, while the swaps were used to support the exchange rate system, they were also used to support dollar liquidity in banks outside the United States. This is analogous to how they have been used since 2008. From the origins in 1962 to the suspension of gold uh, convertibility of the dollar in August 1971, the Fed's central bank swaps were designed to have a range of purposes. Most of the histories of this period stress that they provided resources to intervene in the foreign exchange market. Indeed, this perception is so entrenched that when Member Banking proposed in 2007, William Poole of the FOMC objected that resurrecting them would be interpreted as a signal that the Fed was about to intervene to manage the dollar exchange rate. Certainly, protecting the dollar's gold price was the motivation for this first swap with the Swiss National Bank that was already in place by 1960. The desire by Swiss banks to reduce their dollar holdings at seasonal reporting dates and the preference of the Swiss National Bank to hold its gold in its reserves led to a complicated trilateral short-term swap between the BIS, the Fed, and the Swiss National Bank to juggle flows of Swiss francs, gold, and dollars at seasonal terms. But rather than providing funds to operate in the foreign exchange market, this Fed swap managed seasonal window dressing of commercial banks' growing dollar operations. And this was the model for the origins of the Fed swap system. The inspiration also drew on multilateral central bank support for sterling in the spring of 1961. Then, similar to 30 years earlier, European central banks deposited dollars for national currency at the Bank of England on three-month terms. The value of the deposits was guaranteed, and they were renewable up to three times. When the Bank of England couldn't pay on final maturity, it had to go to the IMF for the funds. The deposits were available to the Bank of England to intervene to protect the, protect the value of sterling during what was expected to be a short-term pressure. This central bank, uh, European central bank deposit system was organized at the BIS in March 1961. And the next year, it was changed into, into what was known as the bilateral concerté. Not formally multilateral, but a system of bilateral guaranteed deposits and lines of credit communicated through the BIS as an information broker and as a willing participant. And this broadened it beyond Europe to include Canada, Japan, and the United States. 
In addition to the European network, there were also bilateral Fed arrangements, dollar deposits against guaranteed sterling, swaps with the Treasury's uh, exchange stabilization fund. And these were all threads to the global financial safety net within Europe and across the Atlantic. In the spring of 1962, Charlie Coombs, the head of the foreign exchange desk at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, traveled around European capitals selling his idea for a wider system of bilateral Fed swaps. It's clear from the archive records of his conversations, firstly, that European central bankers couldn't see the point of standing swap facilities. And secondly, that they weren't keen on getting involved. They worried that the swaps would fund Fed intervention that would go against their own operations. The Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, Morris Parsons at the time, advised that as an exchange operation, we could only recommend that it be turned down. But that it had symbolic importance, comparable to deals done under the Basel arrangements to support sterling. This symbolic purpose um, persisted in 2008 and 2020. Moreover, Coombs didn't have a clear idea what swaps were for. He sometimes said they might use them to support the dollar, but he also said they would provide a groundwork to cope with seasonal payments movements and hot money swings. Eventually, however, he settled on uh, these definitions of specific aims for the Federal Reserve swaps in 1962. So there's a range of aims here to be uh, countering speculative pressures, seasonal swings, um, and also window dressing foreign exchange reserves. Importantly, from the Fed's point of view, they provide the foreign exchange separate from the Treasury controlled exchange stabilization fund. So they paved the way for the Fed to get involved with the bilateral concerté to play its part in the global financial safety net that European central bankers were weaving. This chart shows the value of the Federal Reserve swap lines between 1962 and really up to 1988. Um, and you can see that there's a rapid growth during at the end of the 1960s, the period I'm going to discuss today. Um, there's an increase with the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in 73, and then again in a period of weakness uh, in 1978. You also see that there's quite a range of countries here. So you see the G10 and Japan uh, and uh, the, the other large countries in the G10, but also Denmark, Mexico, uh, and Norway. In 1967, uh, the FOMC tried to, and failed to come up with an ex post set of criteria for who should be offered swaps. And in 1970, when Ireland tried to join, it was refused because the Fed had already decided they didn't want to open the door to more small states. So limiting the range of swap partners has a long history. This was a time of inflation. So this chart gives you an indication of uh, the relative value of these uh, reciprocal swap lines. Um, the blue line shows you the share of reserves of advanced economies, so they reached over 40% of the uh, foreign exchange reserves of advanced economies and 30% of global foreign exchange reserves. At their peak towards the end of the 1960s and into the 1970s, they were about the same relative value as the swaps that were available uh, from the Fed in September 2008, uh, before, the, uh, before the threshold limits were lifted. So they were thus an important part of the global financial safety net, and they were used frequently by both the Fed and their partners. So there's a high frequency initiation and repayment of swaps. This is quarterly data uh, of the Fed's gross drawings and repayments. Um, so you can see that they're used in almost every quarter of this period. Partner drawings are relatively smaller overall, um, and also more limited in terms of time. And I'll be explaining uh, why the uh, Fed swaps sort of evaporate, if you like, in 1971 before being uh, resurrected. As I said, the Fed swaps were also embedded in a broader set of bilateral arrangements. And this gives you a sense of that. Uh, so this is the volumes of the provided under the bilateral concerté, uh, the, FR, the Federal Reserve swap, and the BIS in the total. And these, uh, the bilateral concerté and these uh, arrangements supported the Bank of England, but also the Banque de France and the Banque d'Italia. Okay, but it's a further purpose that I want to turn to now. An important, relatively neglected aspect of the swaps is that they were used directly to affect offshore dollar liquidity through banks outside the United States. Details I'm presenting reveal fresh insights from joint work with Bob McCauley, who was formerly of the BIS, although he may not share my ultimate conclusions. 
In August 1965, the Fed asked the BIS to set up a separate swap to allow the Fed to channel dollars to the BIS. And this became one of the largest facilities in the system, second only to the swap with the Bank of England and equal to the swap with the Bundesbank. It was large and it was important. From 1966 to 1968, it was used five times to provide dollars for the BIS to deposit in the euro dollar market to affect offshore dollar liquidity. At times of political crisis, such as the Six Day War in June 1967, and for seasonal tightening in the market that could disrupt US interest rates in mid year and end year. The aim was to avoid a seasonal spike in offshore dollar rates that could tighten up monetary conditions at home. And this use has a similar uh, motivation to how the 2008 and 2020 swaps were used, although the techniques were different. They were not lender of last resort operations discounting assets at that banks. Rather, the operations were done through the BIS depositing in commercial banks directly. But the injections amounted to the same relative value of dollars, about 5% of the total market. And we find that the operations were followed by an easing of the euro dollar rate, and that the participants certainly believe that they were working. This shows you uh, the activity on this specific sw uh, Fed swap line, which was aimed directly at uh, affecting uh, offshore dollar liquidity, allowing the BAS to do that. Seasonal tightening in the euro dollar market was increasing concern in the 1960s. At the November 1966 Golden Foreign Exchange Committee meeting, Roy Bridge of the Bank of England warned that this December is going to be tighter than any December in living memory. And this inspired Coombs to activate the Fed swap with the BIS to provide dollar deposits for banks outside America. Here are the results of that first initiative. Um, so there's a 200 million pound Fed swap. The BIS also swaps with the Swiss National Bank and puts in a little bit more of its own money. And what you see in the panels here um, are the bars of uh, blue bars, the BIS deposits, and the lines at first the one month euro dollar rate, which you see declining. Uh, also, the spread with the US certificate uh, of deposit rate and then the three month US Treasury bill rate. When the Gold and Foreign Exchange Committee convened in Basel in the first week of January 1967, the pencil written notes record that they thought it was a success. Um, and here's uh, the verbatim record of what Coombs had to say, that it could be a breakthrough, that the BIS had operated more or less as a central bank in the international money market, um, and suggests even more elaborately that some agency should assume responsibility for the offshore dollar market. And his colleagues, uh, the Swiss colleagues and British colleagues, and especially were a bit more circumspect. And they suggested that while well, central banks had an obligation not to cause disturbances in the market, um, and also that they, while well, year, year end operations were useful, they shouldn't have to monitor or manage it year round. There were three more successful operations before planning for final one in December 1968. By this time, Coons was trying to get something more elaborate going, expressing his hopes uh, that other countries would join in um, with swapping with the BIS to provide funds for the offshore dollar market. So if it's uh, by this time that specific swap with the BIS had reached a billion US dollars worth. And he found some um, open doors, I guess, uh, at the Swiss National Bank from Leutfeiler, uh, the Banca d'Italia and the Bundesbank. Okay, if they were so successful, why did these operations stop? And this is maybe as important as understanding why they started. Firstly, the Fed's monetary policy stance moved to tightening, and so the interventions could conflict with the Fed's domestic priorities. There was an asymmetry in the, to the motivation. It was useful when the Fed uh, wanted interest rates to ease, but not when it was tightening liquidity domestically. In 1969, the Fed continued to tighten monetary policy and created a barrier between the onshore and offshore markets to impede American banks channeling dollars uh, from Europe to circumvent tight money at home. Secondly, the G10 central bankers began to fear that their own deposits in the market were somehow inflationary and increasing the global money supply. So at the end of 1971, they agreed not to make any deposits themselves in the market. Thirdly, we have a change in the US administration. President Richard Nixon inaugurated in January 1969 swept through the White House with a new foreign policy stance. The patience with swaps was completely exhausted in the run-up to the Nixon shock of 18th of August 1971, when he suspended the dollar convertibility to gold and allowed the dollar to depreciate. 
In early August, several European central banks, as well as the Bank of England, asked the Fed to draw on their swaps to get exchange cover against an uh, anticipated depreciation. And several, the Belgians, the Dutch, and the Swiss, were likely using these dollars to buy gold. The British, however, thought that they were just doing what the Americans had done before the sterling devaluation of 1967. But the archival evidence suggests that journalists were briefed by the White House to accuse the Bank of England of using its swap to push the dollar off gold. And in late 1971, Nixon ruled out any more drawings of dollars under the swaps. Coombs tried to bring life back into the swaps in 74 and 75, but it was clear by this time that they could only be used for foreign exchange intervention purposes. And they were later resurrected as part of the American contribution to the resolution of international crises in the 1980s and 1990s. What I wanted to demonstrate from this trail through the archives or visit to the sausage factory is that the 1960s Fed swap system had a range of purposes, not just intervention, but also for dollar liquidity. And as in 2008 and 2020, it was part of a wider global financial safety net, although unlike 2008 and 2020, the operations also included IMF backstops. There are several ideas out there at the moment to expand central bank coordination, particularly by extending swaps to more partners and for involving the IMF. In the 1960s, central bank swaps and deposits were channeled through the BIS as the information broker and keeper of the ledgers, as well as a conduit for operations. Now that the BIS governance structure is adapted better to the shape of global finance, it may be a more desirable locus for central bank coordination to pull together the threads of the global financial safety net than it was in 2008. So what can we learn from venturing into the sausage factory? Central bank coordination seemed to operate best in a discreet and confidential environment at the BIS, partly to avoid publicity and parliamentary scrutiny, although central bankers did consult with their treasury ministers. This was expedient and allowed central banks to extend the global financial safety net in ways that the IMF was unable to do, albeit with a democratic deficit. Looking to the 1960s as a heyday of international cooperation, we see that this was a group that did not all have the same interests and frequently disagreed, but they had a commitment to coming to the BIS to foster practical cooperation. The fact that busy central bank governors still make time in their diaries for bi-monthly meetings in itself suggests that these meetings must be useful. Economists are great optimizers. These qualities continue to distinguish the BIS, even though the cozy club atmosphere may be outdated. In the 1960s, international central bank coordination to manage dollar liquidity was effective but short-lived and prone to the shifting political priorities of participants, as well as changing underlying monetary policy goals. Looking at other parts of the safety net, by the end of the 1960s, the British were pushed more firmly in the direction of the IMF backstop when they were unable to repay their short-term credits. Even then, the fact that there was a final group arrangement for $3 billion uh, in 1977 to support the ongoing decline of sterling is quite remarkable. Most historians would warn against drawing lessons from history. As Mark McMillan has observed, the past could be used for almost anything you want to do in the present. It's easy to pick and choose examples that are most convenient or that justify a predetermined course of action. David Cecil's famous quote, the past is a foreign country and they do things differently there reminds us that appreciating the historical context is important before attempting to translate to the present. Moreover, historians are busy unraveling what we think we know about the past and reinterpreting the causes and effects, so policymakers need to keep abreast with current historical understanding. Instead of drawing lessons, I hope that greater emphasis might be placed on drawing inspiration from history, moving beyond only reaching for the history books in a time of crisis to looking thoroughly at more mundane periods of cooperation to see what worked and what didn't and why. There are plenty of challenges on the horizon that will require both cooperative and coordinated responses. And I hope that you will allow space for history to inspire in this uncharted territory. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Catherine, for um, such a, an enlightening tour of the sausage uh, factory. You know? That was certainly very interesting. Uh, let me now uh, turn to the panel and introduce briefly our um, distinguished panelists. Uh, first, we have uh, Adam Tuz, who is a Catherine and Shelby Coulomb Davis Professor of History and Director of the European Institute at Columbia University. <clears throat> then we'll uh, hear from Brad uh, Sester, who is the Stephen 
A. Tannenberg, Senior Fellow for International Economics at the Council of Foreign Relations. And then uh, Linda Goldberg, who is uh, Senior Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. <clears throat> then Ricardo Reis, the A.W. Phillips Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. And finally, Harold James, who is Professor of History and International Affairs, and Claude and Laurie Kelly, Professor of European Studies at Princeton University. Uh, this is very short curriculum there, but uh, let's begin uh, with Adam, please. Go ahead. I hope you can hear me okay. Sound good? Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an absolute delight to be here. And thank you very much, Catherine, for that fascinating talk and the fascinating paper as an aficionado of the history of the swap lines. I was, I was riveted. But as um, one of the two historians on this panel, and distinctly the person on the panel with the least inside knowledge, if you like, of the apparatus of global financial coordination, I thought that what I would direct my comments towards is Catherine's paper as a contribution to history and the way in which she is discussing history here. This is a truly fascinating revision, I think, at the opening of a revision of our thinking about the Bretton Woods system and international economic order in, in general. And the way that Catherine frames it is by reference to the famous account of the interwar years by Charles P. Kindleberger and his emphasis on the key importance of American leadership, a, a message which, for obvious reasons, has great contemporary resonance in these days. Kindleberger described the interwar period as one in which the global monetary and financial system was destabilized by the absence of a hegemon, either British or American. Famously, the British were unable to lead and the Americans were unwilling. By contrast, the relative stability and prosperity of the post-war period was anchored by that American presence. And that, I think, is the Soto Voce theme that runs through Catherine's great paper. But though you rightly insist, Catherine, on that opening point, when I read the text and then listened to you, I wasn't reminded so much of Kindleberger as of Barry Eichengreen. And why that matters is that Eichengreen, writing a generation after Kindleberger, wrote a history of international financial relations in which he argued, at times quite directly against Kindleberger, that the problem was not so much the lack of US leadership, the lack of hegemony, but a lack of cooperation. So in his account, The Great Depression of the 1930s, the classic book being Golden Fetters, he shifts the attention from the United States to France. And this too, of course, is a tradition in contemporary commentary on global imbalances and financial instability that's very live amongst those, for instance, who criticize the uncooperative macro policy positions of the German led Eurozone or China, for instance, and the giant imbalances that result. So, which version of history to pick? As Professor Schenk says in her conclusion, the thing about policymakers using history is that history itself constantly shifts. And to make matters worse, those shifts are endogenous to history, i.e. Kindleberger's view was shaped by his Marshall Plan days. Eichengreen's was influenced by the political economy of the 70s and 80s, culminating in the Louvre Accords, which convinced him that it wasn't so much leadership as cooperation that was crucial. And then allow for the fact that the events themselves are sometimes shaped by actors who are taking inspiration from history, or rather the interpretations of events offered by historians, and you have the completely bewildering reflexive loop, which we know as historicity rather than history, the condition of living in history and the narratives that we write about it. And to my mind, writing as I did and many of us do on this panel, a generation after Barry Eichengreen, he always overdid his revisionism when it came to American leadership. But even if we agree, disagree on that point, what we gained from Eichen Green was a more complex and more multi-centered history of the international political economy. And that's where I see the great value of this intervention by Professor Schenk. It's, if you like, an Eichen Greenian kind of narrative, but with Kindlebergian conclusions. Indeed, you turn up the level of magnification one step further, by which I mean that you break down what leading the Bretton Woods system on the part of the United States actually meant into a chain of acts, instruments of cooperation, operations is the phrase that you use derived from a military uh, context. This is, I think, uh, precisely right. 
which were these actions, these interventions, these specific suggestions and instruments more often than not set in motion by US leadership and backed by American resources, but not just American, of course, nevertheless at key moments with more resources coming from the United States than from anywhere else. So this is this, if you like, Aishin Greenian account of a Kindlebergian story. And as you say, you take us into the sausage factory, you take us into details and instruments of how this works. As a result, there's a sort of lovely mordant note to your history writing. Things happen, but they happen for odd reasons. Instruments acquire purposes they were perhaps not intended to have. Charlie Coombs sort of almost absent-mindedly invents the idea of a global lender of last resort for the euro dollar market in 1967. He stumbles on it in, in your description, finds himself suddenly presenting something quite dramatic. This quality of history, genuine history writing, is often confused with the haphazard, with sheer contingency, but it isn't. It's driven by problems. It isn't teleological, and it certainly isn't functionalist. The fact that something has a certain role doesn't explain that it came into existence. It doesn't mean that it came into existence to perform that role. It could also have happened differently. And it's a measure of the richness of Professor Schenk's paper that in the incongruous setting of a BIS meeting, I'm putting mind, of Michel Foucault's genealogical method. Certainly as history, the result is subtly subversive, it seems to me, perhaps more transformative than on this particular occasion you're willing to let on. I mean, because once you actually look at the operations of monetary and financial politics and the institutions at the level you're doing here, where is the Bretton Woods moment? Where is the Bretton Woods period, in fact? But clearly any idea that it starts in 1944, which is the commonplace in a large part of international relations discussion, simply goes out the window. But even convertibility in 1958 turns out to be just the beginning of a struggle to actually make it work. Within months, they realize that they need new instruments. The IMF doesn't have the resources they need. By the late 60s, they're ramping up the swap efforts in increasingly frantic and controversial efforts to make the system work. And then the next administration kills them dead, as you lay out for us with the classically Schenkian irony that the Brits find themselves using what they thought were kosher instruments only to be accused of using the swap lines to destabilize the dollar. That, I think, to, to me, summarizes your, the brilliant sort of twisty nature of your method. And even then, if, you follow, if I follow you correctly, looking at the charts, it seems the swap balances, in fact, remain in place. In fact, they ramp up in scale, but they're now being used for the explicit purpose only of exchange rate management, which the Americans can live with. To sum up, often the period of Bretton Woods is described as one of relative stability, but from the vantage point that you're giving us here, it doesn't look like that. It looks more like a very wobbly bike with the wheels threatening to come off at any minute, requiring constant patches to the plumbing as you describe it. It seems to me that, um, in a sense, this goes on all the way down to the present moment, as you emphasize in your paper, the BIS itself has had to reinvent itself since 2008. So I just see this as a sort of meta description of what you take the business of international ordering to be. So to come to my conclusion then, I'm left wondering whether you're proposing to us that the idea of the system and the periodizations conventionally derived from that are in fact redundant altogether. And it seems to me that you avoid that facile conclusion, but it's left me wondering what the system does in fact reside in. So let me, to wrap up very briefly, just sketch three possible answers. One answer might be to say that for all the glorious detail you've opened up for us, the basic drivers are after all the exchange rate regime, pegged or not, and capital mobility, relatively free or not. All the improvisations you're describing are driven by that. So the classic dates, 44, 58, 71, retain an anchoring function because they structure the improvisations that are necessary. Secondly, one might say that the idea of the global monetary system exists, the idea exists in the minds of those who operate it. However grisly the sausage making may be, the sausage makers ultimately have in mind the fancy restaurant table onto which the sausage will be delivered. And they keep coming back to that, as we do, in our efforts to describe, analyze, and govern the system. So talk about the system is endogenous to this process of improvisation that you're talking about. It motivates improvisations because we want to perfect it. And then a final option for defining the system might be to start by asking what it is that needs to be regulated and governed. And after listening to you, I would be tempted to say that the really defining chart is the one that shows the euro dollar assets and liabilities on commercial bank balance sheets, that offshore dollar funding market. 
In this sense, it's not so much central bank instruments cooperation, but the capital that really makes this a system, i.e. the increasingly gigantic flows of money in the euro dollar market, what Hyun Song Shin refers to as the interlocking matrix of corporate balance sheets. And it leaves me wondering what this history would look like if one paired your brilliant insights into the operations of the central banking side with a view inside the sausage factory from the side of the banks and the market makers. What were the instruments, the modes of communication, the mechanisms of corporate governance that they were using? That, it seemed to me, would be a brilliant continuation of the work that you're doing here, another history for another time. But thank you very much for this wonderful paper. Thank you very much, um, Adam. Now, uh, <clears throat> Brad, please go ahead. So, uh, thank you very much. I am the least historical of the uh, people who've been invited to comment on this paper. And so, rather than comment on history, or even comment that much on the uh, aspect of the Fed's swap lines that are tied to central bank coordination, I wanted to focus on, in some sense, what the demand for central bank swaps in times of stress tells us about the global financial system and what it tells us about where the dollar needs in the global economy are at any given point in time. And I specifically want to compare and contrast the use of the swap lines in the global financial crisis with the use of the swap lines in the uh, COVID-19 shock uh, this March and April, and emphasize that the need for dollars evolved, that it shifted geographically from Europe to East Asia, and in some ways it shifted from banks to non-bank financial institutions. But I don't like the term non-bank financial institutions. It implies something mysterious, difficult to understand, and complex. In my view, the non-banks are the most simple, in some sense, of all financial institutions, big life insurance companies. So broadly speaking, the evolution is from large European banks to large Asian life insurers. I want to start, though, by going through the possible uses of the swaps and highlight how, at least in my view, over time, the use of the swaps has been narrowed, and it essentially provides uh, short-term dollar liquidity into global markets, largely to support holdings of U.S. assets. Now, there are a bunch of different uses that you could imagine for swaps, and I think the review of history uh, that, of Catherine's provides examples of all of them. You could imagine using them to provide long-term financing to support balance of payments adjustment, as the IMF does. But that hasn't typically been the use, nor have they led, typically, to IMF programs. Swaps could and are used by some countries uh, to inflate gross reserves, provide a bit of window dressing, obscure uh, the true state of a central bank's foreign currency balance sheet. The central bank of China, the PBOC swaps, have served that function in many countries. The money is provided, but there is no intention that it actually be used. And of course, swaps could be used to fund intervention in the foreign exchange market, allowing countries with limited reserves of their own to intervene to try to stabilize the exchange rate. That, though, hasn't been the main use of the Fed swap lines. The swap lines have been used almost exclusively to allow central banks to supply short-term dollars to their own financial institutions, one-month money or one-week money or three-week, three-month money, with the expectation that the use would be temporary as financial market conditions would stabilize. I think this narrow use is part of the reason why the swaps have not been all that politically controversial. They are provided to counterpart central banks rather than directly to uh, foreign financial institutions, reducing the Fed's risk. And then the counterpart central banks lend typically 
against high quality or relatively high quality dollar collateral. And in a sense, foreign central banks have been drafted to a role that importantly helps to stabilize the domestic U.S. market as foreign institutions have come to play a key role as, in some sense, domestic U.S. financial intermediaries. Now, let me turn to comparing and contrasting the global financial crisis with the COVID shock. In the run-up to the global financial crisis, as we all now know, but wasn't so well understood at the time, European banks had become some of the largest shadow banks in the U.S. market. European banks had raised dollars from U.S. money market funds, raised dollars from global central banks with excess reserves who wanted uh, alternatives to the U.S. Treasury market, and in some cases by swapping euros for dollars, and then had used those dollars to hold very large quantities of U.S. financial assets. They were performing bank-like functions, intermediating between global demand for deposits and the like, and the longer-term mortgages that the U.S. economy was generating. Obviously, during the shock, providing liquidity to those institutions when it became apparent that they had built these balance sheets without sufficient offers of capital played a critical role in stabilizing the global system. But if you look at the data, there is one interesting feature. Uh, there was a meaningful reduction in funding to European banks from global reserve managers. So you can actually argue with some credibility that the Fed's swap lines, in a sense, substituted for short-term dollar funding that previously had been provided by emerging market central banks, as those central banks pulled their funds out of the banking system and moved into Treasury bills. At the time of the COVID-19 shock, I think there was a general expectation that the funding needs in the dollar, uh, global dollar market would have some similarity to the funding needs uh, during the global financial crisis. But that only proved to be partially true. The regulatory efforts to strengthen the funding base of European financial institutions actually had an impact. And European financial institutions had a much smaller dollar funding need in 2020 than they did in 2008. Indeed, in some ways, the biggest funding need came not from banks, but rather from insurers. And it is a not so much a funding need as a hedging need. Let me explain. Asian insurers, mostly Japan, mostly from Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, now hold a dollar portfolio of well in excess of $1.5 trillion. That portfolio, in principle, could be held unhedged, in which case there would be no specific need for short-term hedges or dollar funds. However, those portfolios typically are hedged to some significant fraction. And as a result, the steady state funding need for, or hedging need the hedges act as funding in the sense that three-month money is used to support 20-year uh, portfolios of corporate bonds. That need is close to a trillion dollars. During times of stress, and I don't think we completely know, maybe Linda will elaborate, uh, that funding need can evolve in a couple of ways. Some of the traditional providers of funding, swap funding, may want their money closer at hand. They may want it in overnight deposits at the Fed or want it in uh, short-term Treasury bills and thereby pull money out that typically is used to support the dollar portfolios of the Asian lifers. Or the lifers themselves may want to increase their hedging. Either way, there was a large need for dollars, and that need for dollars emerged at least as much from non-bank financial institutions as banks. It, of course, was provided through the banking system. So what lessons or important observations can be drawn from this 
period of recent history. Uh, one, and this is something that work at the New York Fed and has helped to highlight, is that in many cases, the need for dollars comes from countries that are in the global system, surplus countries, and that already have substantial reserves. It isn't the weak links, but in some sense, the strong links that have the dollar funding need. Second, the need isn't directly always funding so much as a need to hedge. Third, by providing funding to these institutions, the Fed helped support portfolios of U.S. corporate bonds and thus rather directly helped stabilize domestic U.S. financial markets. And fourth, since all of the Asian countries that have these large life or funding needs have themselves very large quantities of reserves, the swap lines in a sense substituted for the potential sale of U.S. Treasuries into the market at a time when the Treasury market itself was under substantial stress. My conclusion then is that U.S. provision of dollar funding, both in 2008 and 2020, is, was less an act of benign hegemony and more a practical reflection of the uh, reality that the most efficient way of stabilizing much of the U.S. financial system was to provide dollars to foreign counterparties who could then take on much of the risk of providing funding against the actual portfolios of those institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brad. Um, next, we have uh, Linda. I think that um, Brad uh, just mentioned that the Fed was not doing this for benevolent purposes. Uh, see what, what is your reaction? <laughs> okay, well, thank you for this honor of uh, speaking today. Um, I speak on my own behalf and not necessarily on behalf of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve System. Um, so, with the remarks of Catherine highlighting the roles of the BIS in fostering central bank cooperation and coordination, I just want to start with a heartfelt acknowledgement of all of the efforts and successes of the BIS. And while we often point to the skills and visions of the leadership, which is certainly the case here, um, I also want to note my personal appreciation for the careful and dedicated economists and staff uh, who worked so dil diligently to support these international efforts, and I've benefited very much from them. Um, today, I'm likewise appreciative of the opportunity to speak at this event. I'm a huge fan of Catherine's work, and I always learn a tremendous amount from her on the evolution of the international monetary system and appreciate very much the attention she pays to historical economic uh, detail and her astute interpretations. So my remarks today, um, you know, actually gel very well with Brad's. Um, I'll focus on central bank swap lines and their recent usage, and I'll emphasize the roles of global banks. Um, in particular, I'm going to argue that the swap lines can dampen adverse implications of these kind of funding shocks for credit provision across all the locations that are served by global banks. And this support to credit provision is broader than just for the network of countries with direct access to swap lines. I'll emphasize also um, that changes in bank business models and balance sheets after the global financial crisis uh, in part stemming from the cooperation among central banks and regulators, uh, further supported the continuation of credit provision through banks to their locations served, the locations they served during stress periods. Catherine's analysis shows that, um, that the central bank swap lines historically have been used to stabilize dollar funding markets and exchange rates, and again, History is a guide, um, but certainly there are some conditions now that are quite different from that earlier period compared to the 1960s and 1970s. 
global dollar funding markets, and cross-border interbank flows have grown considerably. Many global banks have set up rich networks of branches and subsidiaries around the world, as so well documented in the research of Stein Klassens and Nielsche Van Horen. Um, with this global bank presence came more direct lending to non-bank borrowers and the expanded use of internal capital markets within the global banks, which are the flows of liquidity within a banking organization and across borders. I focus on uh, these types of internal capital markets and the liquidity management within global banks in some of my research. During the global financial crisis, um, the conditions of European banks, um, as Brad discussed, were the source of some of the strains in dollar funding markets. The dollar funding needs of these banks then were partially met by um, these banks moving dollar liquidity from their U.S. bank branches. The branches of these foreign banks located in the U.S. initially obtained dollars from the Federal Reserve's discount window and the term auction facility. When the swap lines were established, these liquidity draws, which had been sent cross-border to their parent banks, were largely replaced by dollar liquidity directly obtained through their own foreign uh, central banks. So this dollar liquidity through the respective facilities and through the swaps reduced the credit contractions that otherwise could have occurred both in the United States and in the broader set of locations served by those stressed banks. And as I said, there's a whole network of locations that now are served by these global banks. So my own research, um, as well as a series of cross-country studies of uh, liquidity risk effects on credit provision done by the International Banking Research Network, shows that also that the borrowers in the parent location tend to be prioritized in credit provision over borrowers from other countries. And, you know, now when we turn as well to the COVID-19 shocks from March 2020, um, again, um, Brad discussed this for the insurers, there were some strains that originated in foreign markets, uh, including uh, by the Japanese insurers that had built up their dollar, and banks that had built up their dollar holdings in recent years. Um, however, you know, some of the, as, as described in a, a New York Fed Liberty Street economics blog from June, some of the higher demand for dollar funding by non-U.S. banks occurred as their U.S. branches faced drawdowns on corporate credit lines and faced reduced access to other funding sources. So the parent banks, in part, sought to raise dollars in offshore markets, partially stemming from the onshore needs of their U.S. branches. The parent banks from countries whose central banks use standing swap lines with the Fed met their U.S. branch increased dollar funding needs by obtaining swap dollars and sending some of these dollars back to the U.S. Accordingly, the availability of dollar liquidity through the central bank swap lines supported credit, continued credit provision in the United States. This availability of dollar liquidity also limited the credit contractions that otherwise might have occurred elsewhere across the locations served by those foreign parent banks. Indeed, in the, this COVID-19 period, peripheral markets, emerging markets, frontier markets, um, could have been the ones most impacted in this case, in, in, this, in these times, but this time around has actually been characterized by more sustained provision of credit by global banks across uh, emerging market borrowers. Um, it's also important, and Brad, Brad also hinted at this, to emphasize that conditions could have been much worse without the regulatory changes that were implemented post-global financial crisis, um, leading to a significant decline in the type of global bank currency mismatch um, and 
um, helping to increase bank capital. Stress testing and regulations also improved shock absorption caps capacity in these banks. Um, these regulatory improvements and the dollar swap lines were important in some for helping foreign banks to continue to provide credit in their home locations and in the U.S. through their, um, through their U.S. branches, as well as around the world. This explicit contribution to credit provision perhaps, um, and putting this in the context of some of Catherine's history, perhaps can be interpreted as offsetting a negative shock to credit that otherwise is achieved by supportive monetary policy, but it is different than the earlier price stabil stabilization goals that Catherine shows were so much of the previous discussion of central bank swaps. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Linda. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Ricardo, please. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Uh, the topic of this um, meeting and of Catherine's talk of, of being central bank corporation, international dollar borrowing, is one that's very dear to my heart as I have spent some of my research efforts in the last few years trying to make sense of it. And so by reveal preference, I think it is fundamental in macro as well as to understand central bank balance sheets and how monetary policy is working international today. Moreover, I'm, it's an honor to be here to honor Catherine as she's one of the most lucid researchers in this area, and I have learned very much from her work. Now, Catherine's essay and, um, and talk provided arguments for cooperation among central banks. It was not there in the 1930s, and arguably this is one of the factors that contributed to the Depression and maybe even World War II. It was there in the 1960s, leading to the creation of the SDRs, a good idea that never quite took off, but remains as a good idea. It made sense then, central bank cooperation, and was important in the 1960s in the context of what Catherine calls an emerging system of European multilateral central bank support and other US bilateral credits. It was especially important in allowing for FX interventions to keep exchange rates fixed under Bretton Woods, as many had been before. And turning instead to Catherine's more recent work and more novel work, they allowed not just for FX interventions, but also for offshore euro dollar liquidity for non-US banks, especially between 1966 and 68, with a goal of satisfying an increase in money demand, so not really a lender of last resort, but rather simply an increase in demand for dollars that the swap lines allow the Fed to respond by increasing money supply and in doing so keeping to its inflation objectives. Looking at the 1960s, 1960s experience in Catherine's words, international central bank coordination to manage dollar liquidity was effective. But, she adds, short-lived, pointing then to the reasons why this um, didn't last for much longer. Now, I would like the discussion to add two points. They're naturally based on the experience since the last uh, 12 years, since 2008, since the global financial crisis, which I simply know better. But um, I hope to use them to also shed a little bit of light on the discussion of the 1960s as well as, in particular, the discussion moving forward, like Catherine would like us to do, in terms of how can we use the knowledge from either the recent or the past history to better understand the future of international cooperations, especially given our focus, the swap lines. My first point, I'll admit, is a typical economics content whenever cooperation gets mentioned. Um, me, and it is, what did the parties have to gain? In particular, my first point is going to be that the dollar swap lines were very much in the interest of the Fed ex ante and greatly benefited the Fed ex post. The difficult cooperation question, therefore, for the future is rather whether the foreign central bank should embrace them or not, following a little bit on also on Adam's discussion of uh, Catherine's work. Why do I say this? Why do I say that the Fed was really the big winner out of the swap lines of the, to the, uh, in the 2010s? First, looking at the way in which the swap lines are designed, what the Fed is effectively doing, and Brad has already um, also partly explained this, what the Fed is effectively doing is doing lender of last resort to foreign banks by giving them dollars at a rate that's close to the one they would get at the discount window rate if they were a domestic bank. Now, however, in a domestic discount window operation, the Fed is the one that has to pick the collateral, 
It is the one that has to bear the credit risk if the borrowing bank does not pay back. And it is the one that has to worry about moral hazard and potentially overly risky behavior by the domestic banks that later on may have to be bailed out, in a, bailed out with a fiscal cost. What happens instead with the dollar swap line preventing the same lender of last resort to these European banks that Brad was mentioning? Well, in a swap line instead, it is the foreign central bank that takes all of these three roles. It is the foreign central bank that lends to its own banks, committing to pay back the Fed while giving it domestic currency to guarantee that repayment is part of the swap. Therefore, it is the foreign central bank that has to run the operation, pick the collateral to support the liquid, bear the credit risk if they turn out to be insolvent, and then will suffer from the moral hazard that is created if its European or other foreign banks turn out to take on too much risk and fail in the future. This is true both 2010, but also following on the explanation that Brad gave of 2020, with which I uh, almost entirely agree, of the moral hazard involved in the foreign insurers picking potentially an unhedged position. At an even pettier level, when everything goes well, the Fed makes a profit and made a profit 2010 and 11 insofar as it charges a discount rate that has a badge of penalty. But the foreign central banks do not. So in, across all these perspectives, the Fed is the big winner. Second, in research with Salim Bahaj at the Bank of England, we have found strong evidence that the Fed swap lines had a very large effect on US asset markets. Consistent with what Linda also just said, we found that the foreign banks need liquidity assistance so they could replace fickle dollar borrowing from money market funds that they'd used to make dollar investments in US asset markets. And that's also true, again, following what Brad said, uh, now in 2020, when we think of non-banks in the treasury market. In the counterfactual therefore, where there were no swap lines, there would have been a fire sale of US assets in 2010 and a contraction of domestic credit uh, in 2020, following what Linda just said. What Bahaj found is that the, there was a large effect of the swap lines in reducing the sell-off of US corporate bonds. Indeed, a 50 basis point cut in the swap line rate had roughly the same effect on corporate yields as a loosening of short-run interest rate policy that would lower the one-year treasury by 50 basis points. Now, while we didn't have as good data on MBSs to derive as thorough and as clearly causal estimates of the impact of the swap lines on the MBS market, given what we know about Eurobank's foreign holdings of MBSs, it seems likely or at least suggestive that the swap lines provided quite a bang for the buck relative to buying the MBSs directly. That is, the swap lines complemented the MBS buying scheme by the Fed insofar as, insofar as they allowed it to keep prices in the MBS market from being steady and not collapsing, and did so, if anything, in a more bang for the buck way, because the Fed didn't have to buy the MBSs directly and suffer the risk, but simply prevented the foreign banks from selling them. Third, historical work by Barry Ankin Green on the rise of the dollar in the 1920s, as well as recent causal inference work and economic theory work by myself and Bahaj on the RMB, that is on the Chinese currency, the RMB, shows that the swap line plays also a role in jumpstarting international currency status. The swap line, its existence, um, spurs spurs trade credit in US dollars, which by boosting US dollar loans to foreign firms provides a strong incentive for them to invoice their sales in dollars. The swap line creates or maintains a virtuous circle that is one of the contributing factors for the currency dominance and the exorbitant privilege that comes with it. Now, as, as was noted, the swap lines when they were used in 2010 and 20 was not like this, but as Catherine noted in the 1960s and as Barry Eichen Green has noted in the 1920s, similar policies that played similar roles in the swap line were an important part of why the dollar remained its dominance and its exorbitant privilege. To conclude, the swap lines are a win-win for the Fed. The foreign central bank instead, by promoting them, are bearing and creating risk are encouraging currency mismatches in their financial, both bank and non-bank system, and they're helping to support the dominance of the dollar in the world. On balance, I personally think that the foreigners have more to gain than they have to lose. But Catherine writes about the 1960s that, and quotation marks here, or Catherine's words, the system was pushed on a reluctant group of European central banks by the Federal Reserve. 
I would say that is a lesson from history that is relevant for today and for the near future. And so we put the emphasis of cooperation on this, on how will the non-US central banks respond to the swap lines and their role in the coming years. That was my first point. My second point is that as important as cooperation with the central banks is the cooperation between the Fed and US financial regulators. Now the swap lines, they were part of a package that measures, the package of measures that alleviated liquidity funding borrowing needs in international dollar markets. And this, from the perspective of researchers like myself, creates very thorny identification challenges. But their direct effect as a lender of last resort, using solid economic theory as derived by Salim Bahaj at the Bank of England, is to put a ceiling on covered interest parity deviations. This is much like the discount window puts a ceiling on interbank rates. The direct effect of a discount window is to put a ceiling on the interbank rate. Likewise, the direct effect of a swap line is to put a ceiling on CIP deviations. Therefore, the swap lines are only necessary insofar as there are CIP deviations. Otherwise, private hedging markets would accomplish these goals. Before 2008, CIP deviations were negligible. Introducing the swap lines would accordingly have been at best neutral or useless. It was not a lack of coordination before 2008 that prevented the emergence of swap lines. It was the fact that at the time, they were unnecessary. Swap lines were needed and had all the positive effects that I described above and the other speakers have described, and especially Catherine, because CIP deviations in 2008 between the US dollar and other currencies jumped up to extraordinary levels, often exceeding 200 basis points in some currencies. And since then, they have continued to be high although now in the tens of basis points since then. But why did this arise in the first place? Why did the CIP deviations arise that create the need for a swap line? Well, the research by Wen Chindu, Alex Tepper, Adrian Verdelhan, and many, many, many others, has argued in my, view somewhat in my view persuasively that at least in part, part of these deviations were due to leverage and other financial regulation requirements imposed on the US financial institutions selling forward contracts, selling the hedging contracts that Brad was mentioning. The Fed's swap lines were then partly undoing the damage done by these other regulations. They would have been arguably less needed or not as large if there was better coordination between monetary policy and financially regulatory policy, or at least better market design of the market where FX hedging takes place. That takes me to the present as well, as well as the near future, in, in, in mentioning, which I think is important, the RMB network, the RMNB network by the People's Bank of China. Catherine, like so many of us, um, in talking about history, focuses perhaps too much, I might say, on a Western-focused history and what happened to the US, what happened to the, at the BI, at, um, with the Bank of England and others. But today, in 2020, the largest network of swap lines is the one involving the RMB originating from the People's Bank of China. And that has evolved in interesting, fascinating, historically relevant ways in the last 10 years. Indeed, looking at why this emerged in the first place, we see the role of the offshore Hong Kong market, a clear parallel to the euro dollar market that, met, that Catherine mentions in the 1960s, you have the dual desire by the PBOC of wanting to promote the use of the RMB, while at the same time wanting to keep the tight control of its financial market. And again, especially, you see the role of the swap lines being important, again driven by financial regulation, in this case, the financial repression, the desire for control that the PBOC wants to have on RMB lending. So in many ways, the lessons of history from the 1960s could be well applied to make sense of the last 10 years of the RMB, and especially, and perhaps more fascinatingly, on what will happen over the next 10 years as the RMB grows. To conclude, let me use a more recent and even partly provocative example to illustrate the two points that I try to bring to this panel. Back at the very end of March, regulations and flaws in market design arguably led to severe disruptions in the market for treasuries. The Fed again created a swap-like new facility the FEMA repo facility that allowed foreign institutions to borrow against their treasuries as opposed to sell them, putting, forward, put, putting further upwards pressure on US interest rates. Again, the facility was designed with very favorable risk return terms for the Fed. Again, it complemented its large direct purchase of treasuries then, 
Again, it supported the dollar, in this case the treasuries, as the safe harbor during crisis. Again, to be effective in pursuing the Fed's goals, this program required cooperation by the foreign central banks, or generally foreign officials, that hold such large amounts of treasuries. But this time around, that engagement, that cooperation, was pretty modest. That is the side of the cooperation that, is the rel that was the relevant margin in the last few months, and that will be relevant in the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, finally, we come to um, Carl James. Please, Carl. And thank you so much. Uh, are you hearing me now? Wonderful. Um, it's, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be with you. It was a very, very illuminating paper uh, from Catherine, and it's been a really, I think, uh, productive and uh, very, very useful um, discussion. And so the theme of the discussion is really, uh, what's the point of looking at historical episodes? Um, and uh, the genius of Catherine's approach is that she's looking at not so much the dramatic crises, um, but she's taking inspiration, uh, as, as she puts it, from mundane periods. Um, and the, the 60s do look as if they have some kind of uh, parallels, I think. And uh, you know, that's what I, I, I find uh, really quite illuminating um, about Catherine's approach. And uh, the way in which something is introduced and then gets completely changed in terms of the way that it can be used, uh, that, that's, that's, I think, an almost permanent process of innovation uh, that, that is going on. Um, so the comparisons between the 60s and other uh, periods, um, I think, are about uh, the way in which uh, transitions are being managed. Um, in the 1920s, there was some discussion of that as well. Uh, there was the question of how does the international order, how does the economic order uh, get managed? Uh, was it fundamentally a transition from a British-based system in the 19th century to an American-based system at the end of the 20th century? And uh, Adam's already mentioned the, the famous Kindleberger diagnosis uh, of that. Um, the 1960s um, have a kind of similar aspect if you view it in a different way. It's, it's very tempting, I think, uh, when you look at history uh, to think we know what comes afterwards because we know how the Bretton Woods system is going to break down, but how the dollar is still going to remain at the center of things. Um, but I don't think that that was clear uh, to people in the 1960s, and uh, that's exactly the the point that uh, I, I think Ricardo emphasized with great drama, uh, that this is a very, very self-interested uh, set of calculations. This is trying to deal uh, with a currency uh, that is fundamentally quite problematical. Um, and uh, the way that I think it was often seen in the 1960s and why the BIS then comes to be right at the center of this uh, is that the United States can look at what happened to Britain and think that Britain provides a model uh, for the disintegration of uh, hegemony and the disintegration of reserve status. And uh, there was a nice analogy that some people made in the 1960s when talking about the British pound, which was obviously much weaker and was in a, a almost permanent uh, crisis. So the government is very resistant to doing anything. Um, it should have devalued a long time before, uh, but it's postponed and postponed and postponed until 1967. So the, the, the background to a lot of this is the delayed uh, adjustment of the, of the pound. But when it's viewed from the angle of uh, Washington, but I also I think from New York, um, the idea is that um, the pound and the dollar are like two lame ducks that they need to support each other. And uh, it's very, very important uh, to stop something bad happening uh, to the British pound um, in order to uh, prevent the, the greater damage to the dollar and the, the explosion uh, of the system as a whole. So, um, you know, in a sense, um, you know, one way in which you can think about this 
is is responding to particular funding pressures and the particular balancing requirements of the Swiss National Bank for Swiss banks and what that does to the dollar funding market. But in another way, uh, you can think about it as uh, dealing with a big systemic problem. Um, and so, you know, I think if you translate that now and you 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 move into the um, now over 10 years since the global financial crisis um, in the middle of uh, fantastically uh, dangerous and uh, unprecedented um, moment, um, you, you're, you're looking, uh, who, who are the lame ducks that are supporting each other? Well, it's no longer just funding in the dollar market. Um, you can also think, and uh, uh, Ricardo talked very extensively about the Renminbi uh, network of, of swaps, uh, but you can also think of the uh, the great expansion of euro funding, um, of uh, yen funding. Um, so there are all kinds of really attractive currencies to fund yourself in um, at, at, at low borrowing rates at the moment. And um, you might think that you have a series of uh, lame ducks, uh, multiple lame ducks that are really uh, required to prop each other up. And in that case, um, the, the, the question of how you manage cooperation uh, becomes very much more difficult because um, I think part of the aspect of the 1960s that is so compelling is that it's fundamentally a dialogue between two sides. It's a dialogue between the United States on the one side and France on the other side. The people who are most opposed to uh, your kind of initiative, Catherine, are always in France in the, in the 1960s. Um, in the 1980s, you can think uh, a lot of the discussion was about the relationship of the United States to uh, Japan. Um, in the 2000s, it was all about the United States and China. Um, but we're really dealing with a much more complicated multipolar world in which uh, it's not really clear that these issues can be so easily settled by a bilateral agreement. and. Uh, uh, Europe, uh, Japan, um, uh, Latin American markets are going to play a big role uh, as well. And you know that I think uh, provides a kind of neat point uh, to, 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 to end on, um, to think uh, that in that kind of setting, um, you really need a multilateral setting uh, rather than a set of bilateral agreements, which can then produce um, their reflection in a multilateral institution, as they did in the, in the story that Catherine uh, so nicely told. Uh, but uh, dealing and uh, coordinating with a much greater range of actors um, really is uh, the task that you at the BIS and uh, other international institutions uh, are going to have to deal with um, uh, over the next uh, years. Because if you think about it, um, you know, the story of the 1960s is in a way comforting that you could have innovation in the 1960s. But in another way, um, this looks like a little bit like uh, moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic, uh, that in the early 1970s, um, the world really explodes. And there are systemic challenges then that require much, much greater uh, elements of policy innovation uh, than you had in the 1960s. Uh, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Harold. Um, I think we, we have already uh, run out of time and uh, we're supposed to uh, get some questions from the public. So, um, Agustin, uh, I don't know if you want to uh, give the panel uh, the session in a few more minutes. Uh, I remember at the BIS, we were very strict with time and uh, uh, we had a really rich discussion. So, uh, how do we proceed, Agustin? Thank you, Guillermo. Well, I mean, we had the privilege of, of this uh, extremely lucid uh, and interesting mm -hmm. panel that I think it would be a waste of time to, to, to a waste of a very, wa very wasteful opportunity not to open the floor for another 15, 20 minutes. I mean, of course, uh, we, we cannot close the doors and keep people in the room, but uh, mm -hmm. I think that we all would benefit, at least the ones who have availability of time, to have another 15 minutes or so. Two or three questions might be interesting 
uh, just because I, I just have found the, the, the discussion fascinating and uh, I really appreciate very much uh, the opinions of all, all the participants. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> very good, Agustin. Uh, so if anyone has a question, please um, uh, raise your hand uh, in, in the right hand side of your screen, have your name, so uh, raise a hand. Uh, I have a couple of questions uh, from Emiliano Gonzalez Mota from the Bank of Spain. Uh, so let me begin with this. Uh, the first one uh, is regarding the um, uh, implementation issues uh, with the cross-currency basis swap market. And um, the thrust of the question is kind of a long question, but I will summarize it. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the core of the question is whether it is possible to establish dollar swap lines under strict conditions as structural standing facilities uh, as opposed to ad hoc instruments. So that's the first question. The second has to do uh, uh, with uh, the upcoming Brexit. And this is a uh, question related uh, to uh, the fact that would the Brexit boost the international demand for US uh, dollars as a safe currency in the international markets? Should we expect uh, if a hard Brexit occurs, that uh, the demand for U.S. dollars will increase. So this is the uh, the first question, and um, uh, I don't know who would like to uh, to answer that. But please go ahead and and um, and do it. Brad, you want to say something? Or Linda? I'll, I'll take a stab at the first question. Um, you know, I, there, there is no real uh, impediment to having standing swap lines. I think the key question is how you price them. Uh, if they are priced in such a way that they are only used in periods of extreme stress, you can have standing swap lines with modest use. I think one of the key things, and maybe Linda would want to speak more on this, is that during the, the crisis, the Fed priced the swaps in a way that encouraged their use or didn't discourage their use because the Fed wanted to stabilize uh, conditions in the U.S. markets. So, you know, it's not just are the swaps standing or not, it is at what price are standing swaps made available and is that price sort of set at a level where there would only normally be used during periods of extreme stress? Or is it set at a level that kind of keeps dollar funding markets within a much tighter corridor as part of a broader policy toolkit? And just to add on that, um, in fact, the um, reciprocal swap lines between the uh, Fed and uh, a series of central banks are in fact uh, standing swap lines. Um, so those are in place. Um, and in terms of uh, this past stress event, as, uh, in, as an example, um, during that stress event, the terms of uh, uh, dollars uh, through those facilities were made uh, more attractive. The frequency of operations was uh, increased and uh, the duration of uh, funds available through the facilities um, also uh, was adjusted for the current circumstance with 84 day operations uh, put in place. Um, so just to note that and you know, I don't know if Catherine wants to jump back in from a historical perspective. Mm -hmm. If I could add also completely following on what was said, I think, I mean, so they are standing facilities already, so that's an important point to make, but Linda just made it. But I, I took your question more as, what if we were to expand them to more countries or um, in volume or in ability for them to exist in a more permanent usage, let's put it that way. I think the big challenge for that is how will this interact with the IMF loans? I mean, the swap lines are designed to be loans among central banks, partly as was emphasized in this panel, to lend to banks in the last few years, having to do with lender of last resort operations. Well, the IMF provides loans to sovereigns. 
you could draw this line and say, well, one's for sovereign, one's for banks. But of course, sovereigns and banks, and as we certainly painfully learned during the European crisis with a diabolic loop, between the, there's a diabolic loop between the two, and often that separation becomes very mangled in crisis. And so if one were to expand the swap lines very much in a standing way, let's put it that way, then you really have to think hard about what the international financial architecture, not in a grandiose scheme, but literally just of how do you have the interaction between the IMF's role and the central bank's role, to what extent will they complement each other or substitute each other, especially when there's a crisis and the loop between banks and sovereigns becomes active. Thank you. Right, if I can maybe Catherine, come in. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay, um, just to say that the, there was a lot of concern um, at the origins of the swaps about having standing facilities. Um, and in the end, I think one of the reasons was that if something is standing, there's the potential to use it and adapt it. And I think there's um, there's maybe greater potential for innovation, if you wanted to think about it positively, um, uh, with outstanding facilities, um, as you say. But as Ricardo said, one of the big issues is the narrow range of countries which have access to this. Um, and then the repo uh, facilities that were introduced um, in 2020 were extended to, extended to that kind of liquidity support to a broad range of countries. Um, I would say, though, that to remember that 1960s, there's an IMF backstop to these, uh, to the swaps. Uh, so that link between the swaps and the IMF, uh, there's some kind of practical um, examples of how that's done. And obviously, as we know, the swaps are used for different purposes. Um, but again, looking for inspiration, I guess, on linking up those uh, aspects of the financial safety net. Thank you, Catherine. Um, on, on the Brexit uh, question, I don't know if Harold or Adam would like to come in. I see Adam uh, is thinking about it. So go ahead, please. Uh, well, in, in, indeed, I mean, this is this is obviously a, a tremendous shock. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think, you know, if you think about the, the, the logic of the, uh, the political uh, dynamic at the moment, um, it, it's kind of overlaid by the COVID crisis. And so, uh, you know, we know that Brexit is going to be very, very disruptive, uh, but there's a kind of neat uh, explanation for the disruption that Brexit can cause uh, when people will say that it's the, it's, it's the result of the COVID crisis. So you can fold uh, responses to Brexit, I think, into, into this general um, uh, um, crisis response and uh, the, uh, the the incapacity of the British government in terms of its uh, negotiating strategy uh, will 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 look then as if it's being laid on to uh, somebody else's fault. It's uh, somebody else's fault that uh, the um, COVID uh, was was spreading. Uh, Can I just I, come I, in I, as the only yeah. the only person still? In, I'm sitting here in Britain, <laughs> so I'll be leaving you soon. Um, I, I guess I disagree a little bit uh, with Harold. Um, I think the trade disruption and the way this is going to affect uh, people's consumer patterns and that sort of thing will be felt very intensely um, on top of, layered on top of what is already a very difficult economic uh, climate. In terms of the impact on uh, dollar liquidity or whether there will be sort of an increased demand for safe assets, um, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I have a kind of a strong answer to that. I wanted to bring up um, Ricardo's point, though, about the, the RENMB and the use of swaps as sort of launching an international currency. Um, uh, and and I, I'm not sure whether all the swaps in the regional swap systems are used for the same purposes. Uh, so a lot of the RENMB swaps are so associated with the finance of international trade, and that's one of the kind of big aspects of it, rather than providing sort of liquidity in an offshore currency. <clears throat> Adam, if, if I might, I, I, I would like to venture a, and this is perhaps a thought experiment, but it's an extension into the political domain of Ricardo's very well taken point about the perverse effects of swap lines in the sense of deepening dollar dependence and providing, as it were, a backstop to the highly risk, high risk activity of private actors. Arguably, we saw something similar at the time of the referendum in 2016 with the ability of the Bank of England to essentially remove the financial risk from the perverse referendum. So the Remainers who had engaged in Project Fear and had promised Hellfire and Brimstone 
in the event of, a, of an exit were in fact proven wrong. And that didn't prevent Mark Carney from ending up in the crosshairs of the Brexiteers, because by simply adopting an expansive monetary policy, he was accused of the kind of alarmism which Project Fear. So swap lines to, you know, were, were activated that summer, but were never actually used, as far as I understand it, on a considerable extent. But the broader idea of the perverse effects of a safety net of this type inducing high-risk behavior and perpetuating a high-risk status quo, I think has been brought out in a very striking way by Brexit. Where is the hellfire and brimstone that the rational liberal remainers expected? Um, perhaps we will finally see it in 2021. So far, it's been, so far it's been in abeyance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Uh, I think that we are uh, running against the extra 15 minutes that Agustin gave us. So uh, before I turn it to Agustin, I don't know if you would like to um, uh, conclude with some last thoughts, Catherine. Just to uh, thank the panelists um, for their for their comments and their willingness to engage um, in a time long, long ago and far, far away. Um, uh, I think some of the observations that were brought, I hope, um, show the kind of inspiration that can come from a reinterpretation of historical events that um, people have a kind of a stylized view of what happened and that implicitly or explicitly is informing um, how you think uh, policy is going to unwind in the present or in the future or analyzing it in the recent past. Um, so it's very important, I think, to keep your ears open to reinterpretations of history um, because they're reinterpreted um, all the time. And uh, as I say, uh, can be a source of inspiration, I hope. Um, in an interaction between historians and economists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. This has been um, um, an absolutely uh, fascinating presentation and discussion. Thank you to all the panelists. And uh, obviously, thank you to the BIS for hosting this, this event. So let me turn it now to Agustin uh, for his concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guillermo. Uh, well, I, I basically want to, to thank you all, uh, Catherine, uh, for a very inspiring lecture, to the panel for a great discussion, to Guillermo for sharing this, and for all the attendants uh, for being with us uh, in this uh, great panel. Uh, I don't have anything more to say than, than, again, to thank you and to reiterate my invitation for you to join us here in Basel, uh, hopefully in the in June of next year, uh, to to celebrate, uh, it will be it will be the 90th anniversary of the first annual general meeting. As Catherine said, first annual general meeting was in 1931, even though the BIS was founded in 1930. So I think now we can celebrate the 19th anniversary of our first uh, AGM. It would be a pleasure to have you all here. That would also mean that the uh, COVID is uh, to some extent under control and that will allow us to travel. So in the meantime, I wish you all the best, uh, stay safe, and thank you very much. <laughs>